Chapter 21 of Petticoat Government, Volume 2. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Mark Leader. Chapter 21 of Petticoat Government, Volume 2 by Francis Milton Trollope. Before this dreaded visitant arrived on the following morning, Judith had, however, contrived to school herself into a tolerably tranquil state of mind. She told herself that she loved Frederick Dorking a great deal too well not to make him a good wife, and that if she did make him a good wife, and that his mother saw that they were happy together, there could be no great danger of her disliking her. And under the influence of this reasoning she became very tolerably calm. She could not read, indeed. That, she found, was quite beyond her power, but she managed to sit very respectably still at her work, only she preferred having the pretty little work-table that was sacred to her use placed in the oval recess of the back drawing-room window. At first Miss Elfrida objected to this, exclaiming, "'No, sweet darling, not there. You will seem to be hiding yourself.' But upon Judith's persisting, though with no better argument than, never mind, aunt, the amiable spinster yielded, and after she had done so, felt disposed to think that the young lady could in no way have placed herself to greater advantage, for what with flowers and curtains and bergere and work-table, all in the very best style of a little picture, was quite perfect. And thus it was that her intended daughter-in-law first met the eye of the fastidious Mrs. Dorking, as she turned round to seek for her after giving the scrutinizing glance to Miss Elfrida and her drawing-room, which has been already described as having been so highly satisfactory. It really seemed to Mrs. Dorking, as her eyes first fixed themselves on Judith, that she must have been disappointed had she found her in any respect different from what she was. I knew that his taste could not blunder, would have been her first exclamation, had her thoughts been spoken, and she is positively perfect, would have been the second. But the graceful Mrs. Dorking knew the value of expressive silence too well to employ any interpretation of her feelings at that moment, save a look. To this look followed a very elegant embrace, and then the whole scene went on exactly in the best manner possible. Frederick Dorking was in a seventh heaven of happiness. Everything was so very exactly what he wished it to be, and the mutual admiration so very evident. And thus much being said, it would be needless to follow all the subsequent details which it must be so easy for everyone to imagine. London was now beginning to be London in full bloom, and Mrs. Dorking smiled very pleasantly on her daughter-elect as she sketched her plan of the brilliant campagne, upon which, as she kindly said, they must immediately enter together. "'In many of our goings and doings, my dear madam,' she said, turning with the most graceful courtesy to Miss Elfrida, "'it will contribute as much to my pleasure as I am sure it will to that of your charming niece that you should join us. But I feel convinced that my judgment does not deceive me when I give you credit for knowing a great deal too much of the fashionable world and of all its laws and usages.' not to be aware that there may be some occasions when it would be more advantageous to our sweet Judith, who is now so equally an object of interest to us both, that I should run away with her alone for a few hours now and then. Of course you will choose that she should be presented before her marriage, and I think it probable that, as the most public possible proof of my entire approbation of my son's choice, you would prefer that I should have the pleasant task of presenting her. Tell me, dear lady, am I right? Miss Elfrida assured her that no arrangement could be more gratifying to her feelings in every way. I was quite sure of it, returned Mrs. Dorking, looking at her benignly, 
It rarely happens to me, she continued, to find myself mistaken in the estimate I at once form of persons newly presented to me, particularly in that most essential article, good breeding. My judgments there never deceives me. And as she said that she gave a little intelligent nod and smile to her son, as much as to say, you know me, don't you? His bow in reply, though full of acquiescence, was not so smiling and so gay as her own, and his color was a little heightened as it occurred to him that before Miss Elfrida Jenkins could become fully aware of his mother's perfect savoir-faire in all such matters as those to which she had now so skillfully alluded, she would probably have to endure a pretty considerable amount of hints as to the proper place for unknown old maiden aunts to content themselves with all. However, this was no business of his, and moreover he was quite aware that some little discipline of the kind would, in all human probability, be necessary before any possible sister of Miss Barbara Jenkins could be rendered perfectly innoxious. So whatever was disagreeable in his predictions on the subject was rapidly forgotten, and the evident admiration of his mother for his lovely Judith so completely tinted everything couleur de rose in his eyes that it could have been morally impossible for him to give his attention for a single moment to any object so much in the shade as to escape the influence of that delicious light. And Judith felt very happy, too. She was certainly very much relieved, as well as very much delighted at the manner in which she'd been received by Mrs. Dorking, for Mrs. Chilbert had thought it best to give her a gentle hint upon the peculiarities attributed to that stately lady. Mrs. Chilbert, indeed, had personally no acquaintance with her, but as she happened to know that she possessed the dignified preeminence of being considered as one of the most haughty women in England, she thought it best to put her dear sensitive Judith upon her guard against feeling too acutely any little crumbs of impertinence, the scattering of which formed, as it was thought by many, one of the greatest pleasures of Mrs. Dorking's brilliant existence. The contrast between what she felt might have been her reception and what it really was, rose upon her mind after her visitors were gone more strongly, if possible, than even while they were there with her, and her satisfaction, while meditating on all that had passed, had but one drawback. She did not feel quite satisfied with Mrs. Dorking's demeanor towards her aunt. It's true that she'd made her a multitude of pretty speeches, and on some points had been actually almost gross in her flattery. But yet there was a something now and then which grated against her feelings. But, unfortunately, these feelings were, on Judith's side, rather those of pride than of affection. She did not, and she could not, love her Aunt Elfrida very much better than she loved her Aunt Barbara. For though there were unquestionably many points on which the notions and the ways of the younger spinster were more agreeable to Judith than the notions and the ways of the elder, the broad foundations of her dislike to both were the same, namely their harsh, proud, and unnatural enmity to a sister whose character and conduct were, according to the testimony of Judith's mother, not only blameless, but very amiable. Nor was the exaggerated appearance of fondness bestowed upon herself at all likely to soften the heart of the straightforward, clear-sighted, and thoroughly sincere Judith. In this respect, she perhaps liked her Aunt Barbara the best of the two, so that on the whole the displeasure created by the somewhat doubtful civilities of Mrs. Dorking to this little-loved relative did not very much nor very long interfere with the happiness of finding herself treated like a favorite daughter by the ever-charming Frederick Dorking's stately mother. Nor was it long before the happy Judith was made, as she said herself, ten thousand times more happy still by the arrival of the dean and Mrs. Chilbert at the house of the dean's sister, Mrs. Marshdale. The delight of this reunion with the only individual with whom she had ever enjoyed a fearless outpouring of all her thoughts, hopes, and wishes, 
for not even Frederick Dorking had been as yet admitted to so perfect and unrestrained a confidence, was a happiness indeed, and nothing could more decisively prove that the childish Indian-bred girl really had something more than usually endearing and attractive about her than the fact that Mrs. Chilbert was very nearly as much delighted at this reunion as herself. It was a very favorable circumstance for the happiness of Judith during this brilliant period of her existence that Mrs. Marshfield had a very handsome house in Bolton Row, and moreover that she was a lady by no means unfrequently admitted within very nearly the inmost circle of fashion. Had it not been for this, matters could scarcely have gone on so smoothly as they did. For Judith had not only been presented, but had been so much noticed and admired as to have become a person of too much consequence in the eyes of her mother-in-law-elect for that lady to have resigned her upon any occasion to the chaperonship of any individual not perfectly eligible. As to the objectionable youth of the beautiful heiress, it proved, by the good management of Mrs. Dorking, no obstacle at all to her presentation. Had she been born in England, indeed, as she justly observed, it might have produced a difficulty. But as she cleverly remarked, nothing could be more likely than that the blunder made by the old lady at West Hampton, as related to her by her son, might have, have been repeated by the old lady in Green Street. And really, if they were listened to, a degree of confusion might arise which would interfere in the most inconvenient manner with all her projects respecting the place that she intended her daughter should immediately hold in society, etc., etc., etc. To all which unanswerable reasoning Judith herself could say nothing, Miss Elfrida, of course, would say nothing, and Frederick agreed with his mother in all her reasonings on the subject. So Judith was presented, not, notwithstanding her deficient summers, and took her place accordingly amongst the acknowledged beauties of the season. For a few weeks the debutante enjoyed all this exceedingly, for during those weeks her beloved Mrs. Chilbert remained in London, and the friendly intimacy which had been established between that lady and Frederick Dorking during the seeming difficulties of his early love when without her aid he would have been puzzled how to discover the means of eluding the vigilance of the blundering dragon who so strangely kept watch over the treasure he sought, had not only left a remembrance that could never fade, but made her so naturally a party in all their present plans and projects, that as long as she remained in town, the somewhat too active chaperonship of Mrs. Dorking was in a great measure suspended. During this time, Judith of necessity saw but little of her new friend, Miss Tolbridge, for their modes and manner of living were so utterly incongruous that any attempt to bring them together would have been much more annoying to both than demonstrative of affection to either. But when the leave of absence which the dean thought proper to allow himself on this occasion was expired, and that Mrs. Chilbert was no longer within reach of Judith, she again found time to embellish the existence of her new acquaintance and to procure for herself also the renewal of a suspended but not a forgotten pleasure by often passing an hour or two of the early morning in visiting all the pictures they could get at or in taking a tete -a -tete morning walk together in the parks. All this might be done, however, and in fact was done, not only without the companionship of the man who was soon to be her husband, but without his ever having the remotest idea that such were the habits, such were the hours, and such the pleasure of his Judith. Mrs. Chilbert, indeed, knew the world well enough to be aware that, to a woman of fashion, so absolutely a slave to established routine as Mrs. Dorking, Judith's early rising and active exercise and infinitely more, her independent mode of flitting about with such a person as Miss Tolbridge in order to look at pictures, would appear much too like a bold deviation from established propriety to be tolerated. And, of course, she took care to make her young friend fully comprehend this before she left her. This subject, together with various other themes more or less connected with the important object of Judith's retaining the high place she had so fortunately acquired in the opinion of Mrs. Dorking, 
had been repeatedly discussed between them, and it was not without considerable difficulty that the dean's lady had succeeded in schooling Judith into such a degree of prudent and respectful reserve on such matters as might prevent all risk of the propriety of such maneuvers being ever made a subject of discussion between them. For Mrs. Chilbert well knew that if Judith found herself called upon either to state a fact or give an opinion, she would either do so truly or refuse to do so at all. And it might be difficult to say which of these two methods would be most certain to lead to a disagreeable result. All, therefore, that the watchful prudence of Mrs. Chilbert could hope to effect was to persuade Judith that it was a duty she owed to Frederick Dorking, and a caution which his devoted affection well merited from her, not to involve him in the painful task of arbitrating in a matter of opinion between his mother and his future wife. "'He loves you so tenderly, my dearest Judith,' said her friend, judiciously dwelling upon the only plea likely to induce her free spirit to endure the sort of control imposed upon it, that to my feelings there would be something desperately hard-hearted and ungrateful in forcing such a task upon him. And I would not be ungrateful to him for the world, cried Judith, with tearful eyes and a voice trembling with the deep sincerity of her emotions. But must we always go on so, Mrs. Chilbert? It won't. Do, dear friend, depend upon it we shall never be happy together if we begin by having secrets. Why, at this very moment that you are frightened to death at the idea of my telling him that dear, quiet, innocent Miss Tolbridge and I go very often to the National Gallery together, with nobody to take care of us but ourselves, at this very moment, Mrs. Chilbert, I've got another secret ten thousand times more important, and one that I must and will tell him as soon as I know a little more about it myself. This was said at the very moment that Mrs. Dorton was coming up the stairs in Green Street to inform her sweet daughter Judith, as she seemed proud of calling her, that she should call at half-past nine to take her to the opera that evening. Her entrance of necessity brought this discussion to a conclusion, and Mrs. Schilbert took her leave. But not before she had asked and received a promise from Judith to be with her in Bolton Row at an early hour on the morrow, that being the last day of her stay in town. This ends Chapter 21 of Petticoat Government, Volume 2, by Francis Milton Trollope.